came from uh, a high frequency trading background for the last six years. And uh, now I work for Better Servers here in Orem. And uh, I'm a programmer there. Do some Perl, Python, Java, and uh, a lot of JavaScript. And uh, one of the things I wanted to well, what I wanted to talk to you guys today about is some things that I feel um, kind of make Perl stand out when you compare it to other scripting languages. Um, and I will warn you up front, uh, I'm very prone to tangents. <laughs> so I'll do my best to try to stay on topic, but uh, there is no guarantees. I'm sorry, I need one copy. I will push you if I do have one copy. Great. Yes. For an exact number of copies, that's amazing. How <laughs> many numbers each time? I know, it's great. Huge so, to walk in the door. yeah, so, yeah, great, right, great. Right. Um, did you shut the door real quick? Yeah, you can <laughs> shut it. Yeah. So, kind of off the top, um, probably the biggest thing for me uh, when you compare scripting languages across the board is uh, compile time safety. Uh, Perl has it, other languages just don't. Um, you look at PHP, Python, Ruby, JavaScript. Um, I, I'm sure you guys have seen over the years, uh, like Java New IO, you know, like, uh, or Java's implementation of regular expressions. They're all like, well, we're gonna do PCRE, and they kind of borrow facets of Perl because people love the, the quick and dirty nature of the language, be able to get things done quickly, concisely, tersely, and, uh, you know, quick, uh, correctly. <laughs> so uh, now you start seeing some of these languages starting to borrow um, not just liberally but directly like JavaScript with these with ECMA 5. They've actually have, they have a new directive called use strict <laughs> yep. where they, they take the language and they, they start here and then they shrink it down to a subset of its features. And it's a direct response to uh, Google's initi initiative with Dart. Um, I don't know if you guys know much about Dart, but it's a replacement for JavaScript. It's about 40% faster than JavaScript. And it's because the, the language um, was designed with performance at the forefront and uh, not on the back foot. And uh, the ECMA guys, they don't want to be out of a job. Dang it. <laughs> I knew it. Come on in. We can share. I was thinking like five minutes time to find the place. Oh. Send me some more? No, you're good. So, uh, well, this is my, my personal opinion here. Uh, what I think ECMA is trying to do is get everybody addicted to using the strict mode so they can reduce the, the, the cruft of the language so then they can write JavaScript engines against this smaller subset of the system and then everything goes faster. Then. So then they actually can compete, but you got a lot of baggage, you know? And one of the funny things about use strict in, in JavaScript is uh, they don't want you to declare it globally. You know, I'm sure you guys are used to typing, you know, using in Perl or using in Perl, use strict, and you apply it to your entire program. And any module you import, well, you kind of want that to be there too. But in JavaScript, you've got, you know, jQuery, D3, all these crazy libraries, and you import, you use strict, you use strict there and apply it globally, everything explodes quite spectacularly. So it'll be a little while before they get it, but um, typically, um, you know, with Python specifically, uh, it relies on more of a static analysis type program, like a PyLint or a PyChecker or something like that. Um, I'm a huge fan of static analysis, personally. Uh, I program in, in Objective-C quite a bit, and uh, you know, Xcode, I just go boop, boop, and it tells me every single memory leak in my entire program, you know, up front, shows me the exact line that's caused it with nice little pretty arrows going up and down. I'm like, oh wow, this is great. And I go through and fix all the little bugs and hit recompile and everything works and, you know, submit to the App Store and they accept the first try. I'm like, yeah, you know? <laughs> so, um, Hooray for static analysis. Boo for, you know, be able to type Perl space dash WC and hit return and not execute the program, but do a, not just a syntax check, but other compile time checks is really a big deal. I don't think a lot of people outside of Perl understand that, okay, if you use other languages, you just don't have that. Um, so let's talk about strict for a little bit. I'm sure you guys have covered strict 
billion times, but there's a couple of things I just want to go over. Um, MJD, you know, Mark, Mark Jason Donis, he kind of went off on uh, FC, um, he went off on uh, people basically telling people to use use strip without even knowing what it does. And he said that was just as bad as uh, not knowing what it did in the first place. But that was a pretty astute point. Um, I'm not sure if that means go learn use strip or don't use it and don't learn it. I don't know. <laughs> um, but you know, he had some, some interesting points there. I I, um, I included the link to his his, uh, his twelve views. I think they're 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 older views, but I mean, a lot of them stand the test of time. So really, we get a chance. I remember in that in his little tirade, he suggests that people should not say use strict. They should explain ah, use strict vars that's because right. that's right. we'll do this for you. Right. Yeah. So use strict vars is where we're or going. Or use next. strict refs or whatever. Yep. So no one uses use strict refs, or right. at least they don't mean to. Yeah. Yeah. Grab a chair from out there. Yeah. Oh, wow. um, so symbolic references are something that I'm, I'm guilty of this as a programmer. I remember when I first started to learn is, well, how can I store the name of a variable and then be able to access another variable that's named the value of that variable? You know, like yeah. foo equals bar, and then I want to access the bar variable with the value of foo. Uh, so you figure out like associative arrays, it's kind of a kind of an issue. <laughs> so um, I, I, when I was going through and, and writing this up, I was looking at the the Perl doc for use strict, and uh, I thought it was funny because uh, it was out of, it was out of date because the, the state attribute in uh, five fourteen or sixteen on state. Anybody know? You know? Sixteen, fourteen. Fourteen. Yeah. Right. That's fine. Um, in case you don't know, state is the functional equivalent of uh, static in other languages, where you can declare uh, a class level attribute for like, you know, like a hit counter would be an example. If we're in a single threaded application, I could say sub foo state bar and then bar plus plus. And even though it, it traverses the subroutine the second time, it doesn't redeclare the variable, it maintains its state and then it just increments that, that one over and over. Um, I get a kick out of the fact that Perl loves to take complex things like static, which is an overloaded keyword in every other language, um, and use it for a bunch of different things. But in Perl, it's like eh, state, and, and it makes a little more sense to me, so I actually appreciated that. But um, anyway, um, use strict subs. So I think I'm probably one of the few people that think this, but I. I really dislike calling a subroutine without an ampersand in front of it. A function, to be very clear, a function. Uh, I like the syntax highlighting. Um, I don't particularly care for bare words all that much because uh, bare, world, bare words are file handles in my mind. That's the only, I mean, and really, I mean, when you, when you talk about file handles, you typically have to deal with them with type flops, but we'll get into that later. So, on the second page, you can see there's lots of ways you can call a function with strict on. And one of the things that's neat about Perl is the fact that, you know, obviously we can talk about context, list context versus scalar context versus void context. Um, the, the way you call a function uh, in Perl and return elements from Perl are, is, is somewhat unique. Where, you know, the simple one would be, Name another language that can return more than one value as a result of a subroutine call. Go. Go? Okay, fine, 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 go. See, if it goes new, that doesn't count. Scheme. Scheme? Okay. All right. But no, that's a list, though. It is a list. But you don't consider a list a language? No. <laughs> I consider it a toolbox to build DSLs. <laughs> Fair enough. So does, so does a guy named Steve. Right. So. Um, I'm confused because I thought Perl actually did return a list that would. It, 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 it is. It is. It is. It is. It's because it's a lot of languages context. can return tuples or things like that. True, but um. But the destructuring assignment. Okay, well, let's. Uh, well, I, um, let me. I want to talk about one array, but not right now. Okay. <laughs> this um, is supposed to be the intro, so that's okay. Yeah. So out of these. Six, five, five calls, I can count, uh, to my sub, 
two of them actually return uh, different things. And uh, I'm not. I'm not sure how I want to say this. It is something that's different about Perl, but I'm not sure if it's a good thing either. Um, but it's sort of like in any other, any other programming language, having the flexibility, maybe there's some reason why you need to be able to do this kind of stuff. Um, but so when you call my sub the first time, it's going to print an empty array ref. Uh, the second time, it's actually going to dump out one, two, and three because it's going to pass the current stack frame over to the other function. Same thing with uh, the last one, where I doubled the reference. So normally you couldn't do ampersand, open quote, my sub, because strict's on, and strict subs is on. But if you capture and then re dereference again, it sort of bypasses you strict. Strict only goes one level deep. So if you run that program, it'll, it'll run, and it'll dump out the second time, which is interesting. So, I don't know. For the longest time, I thought turning off uStrict was the devil, and I would never ever do it in a million years. Until one day, I learned Python, and somebody showed me Dir, and my head went like, Poof. like you got to be kidding me! Introspection that easy? I mean, I I came from a Java background, and doing reflection was like pulling teeth and just pain upon pain to do anything useful. And Python's Dir was like beautiful. I was like, you got to be kidding me! I can just Type Python hit return, instantiate a bunch of things, type error on those, and you know do runtime introspection with no penalties, no complexities, and it's there. And I'm like, Perl's got to be able to do this. I mean, come on. I mean, we got type blobs. We know what's going on. We got symbol tables. We know what's up. And unfortunately, the only way I know how to do introspection in Perl is this horrible snip of code down below where I instantiate an IO file object, and then I iterate over, um, oh man, I have to turn strict off inside of this block mm -hmm. because you're going to concatenate uh, colon colon onto the end to treat it as a namespace, or sorry, a package space. Mm -hmm. um, but then within that you can say, is there a, is this whatever I'm looking at, uh, the string underscore, uh, iterator, sorry, iterator, um, is there a subroutine defined in that particular package space for that name. And the ones that are, I grep out and I print. But um, pretty much that's the only reason I can think of to turn off use strict. Um, I live and die. I, company I used to work for, um, our entire retail trading platform was written in Perl. I'm sure if you look on like Perl jobs or whatever, you'll see automated trading desk pop up from time to time. I used to work for those guys. Uh, they handled like 10% of the U.S. stock market with like 60 machines running, what's 60 times 40? Uh, many, 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 many Perl processes and uh, all single threaded and, uh, you know, a lot of excess. But uh, there was a couple times whenever I needed to do some introspection uh, because of a quirk in some excess code that we were using and um, when I did my code review with one of our senior guys and they're like, you just turned off strict. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I mean, so, um, what's, but what's the, what is neat though about, about strict is the fact that you can turn it off inside of a block and then it, it turns back on out of it, sort of like a local. Um, again, the only language that, I, that I'm aware of that's capable of doing anything like that would be Haskell. Go ahead, hit me with go again, I'm gonna do that. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. So, um, hooray, compile time safety for variables. Now let's hit my favorite module, third page. Fields. Anybody use fields besides me? Show of hands. Please, please, come on, please. Somebody, come on, use fields. Oh, it hurts. It hurts. <laughs> Something about cookies? No. Now you need to no. explain what it is. <laughs> Which version? <laughs> I don't know what it is. All right, all right. fields. Okay, fields is a... Is a um, Pragma that allows you to pre-declare um, attributes of an object up front. So but what's neat about this is it gives you compile time safety of those attributes before your program even starts. Same as compile time safety on, on variables. So if you are writing a program and uh, you've got an object 
and it's got like five or six attributes, and you accidentally mistype one of those attributes, instead of dealing with a runtime exception, um, let's say we had that capacity to say, you know, let's say you turn auto vivification off, which I could talk about that for about an hour, so I could like really calm myself down. <laughs> really love auto vivification. I love the fact there's a new, a new module where you can turn it off, and it's also lexically scoped, which is just like, <laughs> Okay, sorry. I know, tangents, can't help it. Uh, I'm very passionate about Perl. Um, so, Fields has been around since the Dark Ages. Um, it, like I said, you, if you look at the example, you declare a package, you say use fields, you declare your field names, and then in your constructor, um, let me back up for a second. Everybody's familiar with my and our, and I just described state a minute ago. That's the third way you can declare a variable in Perl. Um, if you look at the Perl doc, or sorry, Perl, is it funk or ref? It's funk, isn't it? Ah, uh, dang it. Well, wherever my is defined, it's one of those two. When you look at my, it'll say my and then type and then the variable, and then I believe there's a colon for like attributes. Um, when you use fields, you have to declare the type of your object before you go and use it. Otherwise, the, the magic of the compile time checks don't actually work. But uh, this is like, like the cornerstone of our trading system because we, if we had a, a runtime error or if we you know, vivify to try to go reach into a variable, an attribute of an object that wasn't there and we were expecting it to be there and it got undefined instead, you know, we're talking, talking millions of dollars every three seconds. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the ability to um, have that compile time safety of all of our attributes for all of our objects up front was just like massive. And you can't do that in any other language. Aren't fields or attributes used by Catalyst for uh, attributes are. routes? Attributes, attributes are. Attributes are, are, attributes are uh, I can talk about attributes for a second. Um, so I'm a huge fan of uh, annotations. If you're familiar with Python or Java or any other language. I, from what I read from the proposal for, for attributes, it's, it's Perl's kind of answer to it, and Catalyst will kind of use attributes to, um, sorry, let me back up. When you declare uh, a method, uh, you go sub foo, colon, and then attributes. And then attribute handle will allow you to sort of um, ask questions about methods, and you can give it sort of metadata. Um, it's just not as good as, as annotations. I, it really bothers me that, that Perl hasn't, uh, I mean, I know, Perl 6, or you could use, I mean, I'm sure Moose or some other mop has uh, annotations that are good, but those are all things that are layers on top, and I really want the core Perl just to do its thing, but anyway, so um, is anybody here stuck on a Perl that happens to be before 5.9? Perl? <laughs> Sorry? What are we using? 5.8. 5 5.8? 5 okay, that's interesting, because, so one of the other reasons why... No, it's no, no, stop it. Stop it. <laughs> interesting. No, this is really interesting. Come on, give me a break. Um, per, prior to Perl, Perl 5.9, uh, fields backed their their data structures against pseudohashes. And you're probably saying, well, what's the big deal about pseudohashes? And I'm like, well, if you're doing high frequency trading, you know, doing uh, attribute lookups via a hash versus a pseudohash is actually quite telling in performance. Um, pseudo hashes are backed by arrays, and you have you know a constant time operation for uh, accessing uh, attributes of a pseudo hash. After 5.9, they switched to restricted hashes because uh, if you've ever looked at the source to the pseudo hash, um, what's that saying? Um, beware, there's dragons in here or something like that. <laughs> it's kind of one of those things. Like, if you ever read the mod rewrite man page, oh my goodness, same same deal. Or the sendmail.cf man page. Yeah, I put those three things in the same category, <laughs> to be honest. Um, it's kind of a good thing to get rid of pseudo hashes, but I miss the performance. Uh, restricted hashes are really nice, though. Um, my two favorite Perl modules, honestly, are scalar util and hash util. Well, actually, three. Scalar util, hash util, and list util. I mean, it drives me crazy that a lot of those functions aren't first class, and they kind of bury in these modules that, unless you program in Perl for a long time, you don't find out about. Um, I got one for you. Uh, a scalar in Perl, everybody knows what that is? How many values does a scalar have? It's three. It's three? 
isn't it? You have a PV, which is the string. You have a SV, which is, or, or you have a PV, you have an IV, which is an integer, right. and then you have a, a what, I forget what it's called for floating point. Yeah, yeah. right. So dual var in scalar util will allow you to change those individual sub-attributes of a yeah. scalar. So you can do horrible things like declare a variable to 10 and then set the dual var, the, the, the string representation to hello. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, I mean, again, yet another thing that Perl does that... Which nobody in their right mind would do. <laughs> but you know, that's been, the reason why is because, I mean, you, you can think about just the, the first thing you learn about Perl. When you compare strings, what operator do you use? But there is a dual var uh, that is commonly used, and that's the... Uh, the scalar that that is huh? set when there's an exception from the at uh, uh, string at no uh, string I'm sorry dollar bang isn't it? yeah dollar bang that's it dollar ah. bang is, yeah is set um, is set as a dual var and you can query it as a right. as numerically or yeah. as You're a string right. and it's, it's You're different right. Right. Yeah. so is that why the comparison operators are different for strings and yeah. Well, it's one so you're familiar with the many reasons. You're familiar yeah. with the, 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 the term coercion, right? Sure. Yeah. So coercion really means whatever equality operator you happen to be using, it's going to try to mangle that variable to match, to match the equality operator that you're using. Right. If you only ever use it as an integer, then it doesn't even have the string portion right. of the scalar right. fill. Yeah, First time you yeah. use that integer as a string, then the string portion gets filled behind the scenes. So. All right. So I'm going to skip ahead. Um, <laughs> And the technical term for that is dynamically typed? Is yeah, right? well, yeah. you're dynamically typed, but I mean, uh, I want to use the word duct typing a little more than I want to use dynamically typing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it's what it is, right? Perl doesn't follow a lot of uh, classical computer science um, paradigms. It, it grew out of Unix, it grew out of Satanoc, and you can tell when you look at it. Um, um, real quick. You you said you liked uh, scalar utils. What were the other modules? List util and hash util. They're I'm awesome. Gonna check them out. They're awesome, hash awesome, awesome, awesome modules. List util and hash. Hash util. Yeah. They're, they're the best. XML simple. Let's see what else I like. Data dumper, obviously. Been gone for a while, but I mean, I got, got, got and fields. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> How long have you been coding for? Uh, since 1997. I was guessing further back than that, if you still want ampersands on your function calls. I want ampersands on my function calls. I know, Perl 4, I, I did that. <laughs> but you know, come on, but listen, how many other languages do you know besides basic that use sigils to prepend their variable names? I mean, let's be consistent here. If we're going to use variables in front, sigils in front of our variables, let's use sigils in front of our, of our functions. And we should have a sigil for our methods as well. We should. I, I, when you, when you want to pass a reference to a subroutine, you have to use an ampersand. Yep. And we've all That's agreed that bare words. I am aware of that, that, that the backslash is not a reference. <laughs> but you still have to put the ampersand on there. You can't just do backslash name of function. Oh, I see. Yes. All right. So let's look at the, the, the use field thing real fast, and then I'll talk about something else real cool, and then I'll be done. Um, so. You can see I declared a foo module and then I assigned A and B. If you would assign D, C, or D or E or F, and you did a Perl dash WC on that thing, it will not run. It will compile time fail. That is awesome. I'm telling you, it will save you tremendous amounts of time. Um, Especially because I have poor spelling, so that's. I, I'm that's horrible. Like I have, I'm dyslexic with certain characters. Yeah. My brain will like go boop, and they'll just switch them like. <clears throat> It's, it's, it's bad with me. So if you do a print dumper on foo, you'll see, it, you know, you know, bar one, you know, blah, 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 curly brace, A equals uh, one, B equals two, and that's it. But if I do a print dumper on legal keys, and I dereference foo, it'll print out ABC. So this, oh my goodness, stand back, is introspection <laughs> without using that stupid no strict tactic. So uh, that's the only trick I have to show you guys today, uh, <laughs> honestly. Um, other things I want to talk about real fast. Um, unshift. Unshift is awesome. Now, I know another, a lot of languages have unshift. But what's cool about Perl's unshift is it's actually a constant time operation. What? So what I'm saying is, uh, if you have a, a, a list, let's say with five elements, 
and you unshift to put this new one on the front, in any other programming language, it's got to go off and create a new, well, let's say it's like locked down, right? So we're going to have to like go off and create a six element array and then copy one, two, three, four, five and put zero, the new one at zero, right? Perl actually initializes their lists slightly ahead of the, the, the pointer is a couple notches ahead. And it depends on the implementation. I don't, I don't want to be specific. Um, but that allows you to call unshift multiple times before it has to go back and rebalance the data structure, which is awesome. It's, it's slightly more expensive than push, though, isn't it? I think there are a couple more operations involved. Push adds the end of the list. Um, it's the same thing. Right, but like in the excess code, it seems like to do a, an unshift, you've got to call two or three macros, whereas to do a push, it's just one macro. True, but you don't have to reorganize your memory, which is the more, yeah. it, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's cost time versus log time. ends. Yeah. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a performance penalty for yeah. sure. Um, okay, so I talked about all these awesome things that Perl does better than other languages. I, I figured I'd just touch on a couple that drive me crazy that I can't <laughs> seem to do. <laughs> Obviously, you guys are familiar with like signatures for methods where you say sub, foo, open parenthesis, dollar, dollar, at, close parenthesis, and nonsense like that. I have never used any of that stuff. I've looked at it and I can't see, I can't get any benefit out of it because it's not compile time. Um, but yeah, function prototypes are just really horrible. Now, Chromatic, if you read his modern Perl blog, he's been campaigning for uh, method sig or function signatures and method signatures for like, oh, I don't know, five years now. Um, it's gone nowhere because the parcel is too darn complex. No one can seem to figure out how to jimmy in a code patch in without breaking the whole thing. You got it, Tommy? No, they, oh. <laughs> they were, they, there was a big push for that at um, Yapsi NA this year. Yeah. That they, um, they're they really trying to get a lot of that ready and they're doing a lot of experimental stuff that's going to be in 520. That's, that's, awesome. that's hopefully going to be... Do, do wait, is, wait, is it 20 the stable though? Would it be 21? Is it odd no, numbers? They're, they're, cause what they're doing now is with the experimental, they're going to have that as you can turn on those experimental features. Well, like use feature? Really, so you'd be able to use these experimental features. Use feature, that's another good one. I didn't even think of that. I mean, a language that can like change the code path <laughs> the program going to go down based on, you know, a use statement, which is, you know, it's, it's runtime, but it's the first thing that happens after the, does use happen before or after begin blocks? I don't, I forget. Anybody remember? It's, it coincides with, it's, it is yeah, a I don't like block. that word. I want, I want, I don't know which one. <laughs> but it is, a, it is a, it's putting a require in a begin block, essentially. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. Okay, so, uh, I wish I had, uh, I wish I could pre-declare my methods of my objects up front. I, I wrote an experimental module uh, four or five years ago uh, to do this, and uh, sort of like what the guys are running into trying to add uh, signatures, uh, I ran into some of the same things. So then I tried to play the, the Dart game, right, JavaScript. I tried to shrink the language down and tell my developers we can only use these parts of the language because I can't figure out how to make this patch work with these parts of the language. And they didn't want to do that. So <laughs> that was the end of that patch. Um, right, so I would really love compile time safe for safety for, for methods of objects. Um, I, I think mop, uh, mops, mo, uh, not mo, uh, moose, and some of the other things, I think they could use things like that, but I don't think it's true compile time. I think it's like, Compile time and then moose boot up and then it does some stuff. But I'm I'm not an expert on moose, so if you guys know, let me know. Um, right. So obviously we we covered sigils, we covered context a little bit. List versus scalar uh, and void once array. I mean seriously, a language that can figure out who, the context of which the subroutine is being called, and then you can alter the subroutine's behavior on how it does its return. That's some voodoo stuff right there. If you look and at contextual return, the module. Yeah. That's a really goofy. It's horrible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's really crazy. I mean, the fact that Perl has a CPAN and they have a namespace named Acton. Acton yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whitesmith. Yeah. Acton Whitesmith. Wasn't it called Bleach at first? Acton Bleach. Yeah, well, you have the, uh, the Bleach. Right? It actually yeah. has Acton Bleach. Okay. Sorry. Acton Bleach. Damien. Damien. Yeah, Bleach is awesome. And I, another one that I loved was uh, when I first started getting, not first, but 
I don't know, I, I bought some book and I found uh, Park Rec Descent and learned about bottom-up parsing. I was like, what? <laughs> some smart dudes in Perl. They do some crazy stuff, like short scene transform. I mean, yeah. it's just the, the decorate, um, sort, undecorate mm -hmm. pattern. But Perl's syntax gives it such a beauty that, you know, can't really do in other languages. Um, talked about dual var being crazy. Uh, auto load, I mean, who in their right mind came <laughs> up with that? I want to strangle them. Um, type globs, you can go into that. Uh, a really, really far out one, if you want to really go digging. If I, if, I, if I do another one of these talks, I'd love to talk about MRO. It's the method resolution order module added in Perl 510. Oh, was it 10? Yeah, it's pretty old, I think. Uh, awesome, I've used it. Um, when you have a large system that's doing like crazy stuff like trading stocks. Um, method calls, when we did our profiles, we used uh, Devel MIT Prof in case nobody cares. Uh, method resolution order was like a huge chunk, like a, a, a surprising amount of our CPU was being devoted to figuring out which method to, to go and call. And when MRO came out, we upgraded, and I wrote my own custom method resolution order, and Holy moly, I like increased the performance of our system by like 15%. It was impressive. Because we get like really deep functions where like seven, eight layers of inheritance is just weird. Is it mostly useful for multiple inheritance or is it? Yes. Like Specifically, yes. Um talk about attributes. Um I could tie. I could, I could talk about an hour about tie. Tie's bonkers. Um I guess to sum up, uh, if you're not using the, the Perl module find bin, you should be. <laughs> I love find bin, I can't help it. Uh, anybody have any questions or anything? Um, what, which other, um, what, what other things do you like about HashiTool? That's one that I haven't ever, but as I started looking at it, what, what other things do you like to um, use, um, in that one specifically? You know, uh, being able to lock keys, that's nice. Uh, if, I'm, if I've got a data structure that I don't want someone to be able to make modifications to, Perl has always been of the mindset, you know, we have no private variables. So the ability to hand a structure over to something else, and even by mistake, you know, they could try to like accidentally change the value of, of, of a particular attributes. Uh, being able to stop them from doing that is fantabulous in my mind. It's like making a hash strict. Exactly. Which, uh, which then you can start thinking of a hash as a namespace yeah. and its elements as variables, essentially. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, type blobs, I mean, namespaces and type blobs are yeah, essentially the same yeah. thing, you know, yeah, yeah. Just <laughs> the way they're implemented. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, like I said, if I, if I had more time, I would go into um, yeah, XS and XSPP, uh, tie, type blobs, autoload is the devil. Be sure got that real clear in everybody's head. Except for when it's awesome. No! There's never a case with all of those. Yes, <laughs> there is, and I've used it. Oh. Okay, like, uh, we use Mojalicious at Better Servers, and um, Mojalicious actually is the, the whole thing is like pinned on auto load. Like, if you know how it, the whole thing routes itself through auto load, and the performance suffers terribly because of it. It's, it's, if I could change anything about Mojalicious, which I won't because I don't want to fight the developers, um, I would do that. That would be good. But anyway, so let's summarize real quick. Use strict is awesome, fields is awesome, and uh, restricted hash, hash util, scalar util, list util, all awesome. And these other languages don't have these features, and they never, they never except for Haskell, I guess. Haskell can do these things. I mean, Haskell could do it at runtime too, but you know, bugs. What happened to it, right? Cool. I'm done. <laughs>